Pastor Greg Boyd says he was speaking at a Christian music festival when he saw a girl with the word doubt printed on a t-shirt. The word was circled in red with a slash through it, meaning no doubt allowed. Is it okay to have doubts? Sometimes there's this idea that if you believe something is true and you pray for God to do it, then that's exactly what he's going to do. The only thing is, if you have doubts, that might prevent it from happening. If you have doubts, that means you obviously lack faith and God is not going to answer the prayer if you have questions about what he's going to do. Well, I had some friends in high school that got married and they started attending this group that claimed to be Christian. In this particular group, the belief was that if you prayed for something and had faith, it would happen just as you prayed for it. Another one of the, the beliefs was that if you had a physical problem of any kind, it was because you had, hadn't prayed with faith to have it removed. Well, in the case of my friends, they both wore glasses. And because of the beliefs of this group, they stopped wearing their glasses, believing that God was going to give them perfect eyesight. And yet it was, an, it was apparent they didn't have perfect eyesight. I remember playing a board game with them, and they had trouble reading some of the game cards. But they refused to wear glasses, believing that God had healed them. And after enough time had passed, they resumed wearing their glasses. And because God had failed them, it was a long time before they ever went back to church again. Had God really promised to give them 20-20 vision? Was it okay to have doubts? You know, maybe that's why God didn't give them perfect eyesight. Well, James talks about praying to God, and on the surface he seems to be saying, don't have any doubts. James 1, 6 through 8, he says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So it appears like James is saying, you must believe and not doubt. You know, what could be clearer than that? There was a song that was sung years ago with the title, Only Believe. Only believe, only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Now it's true that all things are possible with God, but is it true that if you only believe that God will answer your prayer in a certain way? Is God only going to do something in a certain way as long as you're certain it's going to happen? And if it doesn't happen, was it because you doubted or because something was wrong with your faith? Must you believe without an ounce of doubt? Is that what James means? Well, James is not promising believers that they can respect to receive whatever they ask for if they simply believe and not doubt. It's always important when you read the scriptures to read them in context. What is James talking about right before he mentions how you should pray? Well, in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, or verse, verse 5, actually, first, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And then in verse 6 he goes on and says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. What James is saying we should specifically ask God for is wisdom. He's not saying that anything, anything at all about you not ever having doubts or uncertainties. The question is, where are you looking for wisdom not whether you have doubts as you're seeking God's wisdom. If you have doubts in the first place, are you coming to God for wisdom? Now the word translated doubt here in verse 6, diacrino, means to separate, distinguish, judge, or evaluate. In other words, it refers to a person who is wavering between competing ideas, convictions, or commitments. They're in the process of evaluating between two options 
and have not resolved in their mind which they should choose. They're wavering in the sense that Joshua sensed the people of Israel were wavering when he spoke to them about their options in Joshua 24 verses 14 and 15. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua saw them wavering, but he had made up his mind about God. Here are some other examples of wavering in the sense James is talking about. Suppose a woman is wavering between whether she should do as her boss said and stay later to work that day or leave in time to make her daughter's piano recital. She promised her daughter that she would be there. She can't quite make up her mind about what to do. This mother needs wisdom for making a good choice. Or imagine a person wavering between options when it seems obvious about which choice is the right one. Suppose a man is wavering between whether to honor his marriage vows and stay faithful to his wife or to run off with his secretary from work. He keeps wavering back and forth between the two, not sure which to choose. Even though he seems to have doubts, he's actually leaning in one direction. The fact that he's wavering between these two options suggests he already lacks loyalty to his wife. This is the kind of wavering James is talking about here. It comes clearly through in the New Living Translation, James 1.6. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. So what the person is wavering between is whether to stay loyal to God and seek wisdom from Him alone, or whether to say they're trusting in God while looking for wisdom from the world about what to do. They're divided in their heart between trusting God and listening to the advice of the world. In that case, their loyalties are already leaning in the wrong direction. You see, the Bible doesn't speak against doubt in a psychological way. In other words, it doesn't call into question you having questions. It's okay to have questions. It's where you turn to with your questions that makes the difference. Are you turning to God to seek wisdom, or you, are you turning somewhere else because of your uncertainty? Now, we live in a world filled with uncertainties. Elizabeth Silver wrote a very personal memoir called The Tincture of Time. It's about her baby daughter's stroke at six weeks and the trauma and uncertainty of life that she experienced for a full year before her daughter re recovered. Elizabeth also interviewed people during the pandemic and she found out their biggest fear was not about getting COVID or experiencing financial loss or even dying from the disease. Their greatest fear was living with uncertainty. She also interviewed people living with various diseases, you know, with a, with a certain amount of medical uncertainty. She learned that how we approach uncertainty in our health is a litmus test for how we approach life. How we deal with uncertain, uncertainty determines whether we live with hope and joy, even though we don't have all the answers. When she asked people who were in some kind of medical crisis, what comes to mind when they think about uncertainty and the outcome of their illness, the overwhelming response was fear and powerlessness. Now, when she asked the healthcare professionals the same question, their first response was challenge or reality. The difference was they understood and expected uncertainty. It's part of their professional worldview, particularly in a world with the coronavirus. She says the difficulty now lies in convincing the rest of us that uncertainty is something we can and must live with. In this world, 
you will always be living with uncertainty about something, probably many somethings. So it's okay to have doubts. Doubt is different from unbelief. Unbelief is, is different in that it refuses to deal with reality. It avoids seeking out the truth. It, it rejects its need for God. Not so with doubt that turns to God, despite your uncertainties, despite not knowing the answer. In your mind, you're not sure about whatever it is you're not sure about, but in your heart, you're sure about God. A pastor named John tells about watching the 2021 NCAA Men's Basketball Championship game between Baylor and Gonzaga. He says, I was watching the game intently, texting my friends as I watched. There was a time when Baylor took out one of its star players, and Gonzaga started to make a run. I was infuriated. I was in a group chat saying, I can't believe they did that. Things are going to turn out bad. And my friend said, what are you talking about? He's back in. And that's when I realized there was a lag in my internet connection. As the game went on, the lag started to get worse. The announcer's voice would say, and he made this shot. But on my screen, the guy would still be dribbling. And then he would shoot and the shot would go in. And I realized there's a lag in my connection. I was so anxious about really wanting to win that when I discovered that there was a lag, I didn't log in to fix it. I just let it stay there. Do you, do you want to know why? Because I trusted the announcer's voice. I didn't think he was going to lie. I knew that his word preceded what would happen. So I let him speak. And I waited. I didn't worry. I celebrated when he spoke, not when I saw what took place on my screen. So it is with our doubts. When you look at what's going on in front of you, it may not be turning out the way you wanted it to or even expected it. There may seem to be a lag in your understanding or in God answering your prayers. Don't let your circumstances or lack of understanding keep you from turning to God, to listening to His voice, to trusting that in time you will experience what He has in mind for you. So there's nothing wrong with having psychological doubts, but there is a kind of doubt that James is warning against. It's about wavering in your trust of a person, in particular, God. For example, when Jesus told the disciples that they could move a mountain if they did not doubt, he was speaking in, in hyperbole or an exaggerated way about the power that comes from complete trust in God. They could not literally move mountains, but they could experience God's mountain-moving power at work in them as they put their faith in Him. The same thing is true when Jesus chided Peter after he got out of, out of the boat and took his eyes off of him and started to sink. Matthew says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now, Jesus wasn't talking about Peter's psychological uncertainty about whether he would sink or not. He was talking about Peter's wavering confidence in him, in Jesus, his falling trust in Jesus. Thankfully, Jesus is still reaching out to us even when our faith is faltering. This is the kind of wavering that James is talking about, and it's confirmed in James 3 when he says, verse 12, My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives, or an olive vine bear figs? Of course not. He says, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Then he makes the point that if anyone, that if anyone is going to be considered wise and understanding, he says, you must show it by your good life, by deeds done in humility, that comes from wisdom. He says that your lifestyle, your attitude, your, your direction in life, it grows out of the kind of wisdom that you have. You can't be looking to the world's way of understanding and be loyal to God at the same time. James calls us being double-minded and unstable in all that you do. True humility 
is looking to God, accepting what He says, trusting in Him, and not what the other voices are telling you. James continues to say that if a person has bitter envy and selfish ambition in their hearts, he says, don't boast about it or deny the truth. This is the kind of wisdom, he says, that does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, he says, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil practice. If you have this kind of spirit within you, you're going to be double-minded and unstable. So the kind of spirit in you reflects the kind of wisdom that you're living by. On the other hand, he says, verse 17, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Unspiritual wisdom, on the other hand, produces disorder and every evil practice. But those who possess heavenly wisdom raise a harvest of righteousness. What James is really talking about is doubt that comes from wavering between earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. He says don't waver in your commitment to seek wisdom that comes from God alone. People who waver in their, loyal, waver in their loyalty to God and his wisdom, he says, cannot expect to receive anything in terms of wisdom from the Lord. What does seeking wisdom from the Lord give us? Maybe not what we're always asking for, but what we need. James encourages us to, verse, chapter 1, verse 2 and following, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. God will give you the wisdom that you need to know how to persevere and how to live so that you can be mature and complete not lacking anything. That's what you should ask for without wavering. So the larger context reveals that the wavering James is talking about isn't concerned with doubt. It's all about relying on God for wisdom and finding joy in trials to persevere in faith so that you can become mature and complete, unpolluted by earthly wisdom, that's what makes people unstable. But when you trust in God and live for Him, then His righteousness can be fulfilled in your life. There's another passage that people often refer to when it sounds like we should never have doubts. In Mark 11, 24, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you the truth. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Another way we could say this is, don't doubt when you pray, and whatever you ask for, you're going to get. At least that's how it seems to us, is what he's saying. Now this causes all kinds of problems if we take it literally, because it puts pressure on you. You have to have enough faith to get what you're asking for. If you have any doubts at all, your prayer is not going to be answered. Then you must not have had enough faith. Or if you believe and don't receive it, then maybe it seems like God is lying to you. Well, there are several, several telltale signs that Jesus did not mean this to be taken literally. To start with, he tells us to believe we have received what we ask for when we ask for. But the very fact of asking for something presupposes that we don't believe we've received it. If you believed you had already received it, you wouldn't be asking for it, right? Anytime a passage seems to contradict itself, it's not meant to be taken literally. If Jesus meant this to be taken literally, then how do we explain what happens a few chapters earlier in Mark chapter 8, when a blind man begs Jesus to heal him? He says there in verse 23, He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village, 
When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? If Jesus intended his instruction in Mark 11, 24, where he said, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. If he meant that to be taken literally, he would have never asked this man, Do you see anything? Because if he's believing it, he should be seeing. The man said that, he could, while he could see people, they looked like trees walking around. Now, Jesus didn't rebuke him and say that he lacked faith for seeing trees instead of people. No, Jesus prayed for him again so that his sight would be completely restored, and it was. The man was believing, but at first he did not receive what he prayed for. And he certainly didn't already have his eyesight when he asked Jesus to give him his vision. So we have to be careful as we read scripture to discern what is to be taken literally and what is meant in another way. When Jesus says in Mark 11, 24, therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours, he's using hyperbole. He's speaking in an exaggerated way. Anytime you see something in scripture that seems self-contradictory or doesn't fit in with the reality of life, it's probably hyperbole or an exaggerated way to make a point. Jesus has already spoken hyperbole in the same context. In fact, in the previous verse, he says, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen. It will be done for him. Now, does he mean that if you literally tell a mountain to go jump into the sea and you believe strong enough that it's going to happen? No! You will never find a person in this world who can literally have mountain moving power to make the mountain jump into the ocean. You see, the Bible was full of hyperbole, things that are not meant to be taken literally. Jesus uses it all the time. In Matthew 5, 29, he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that you should literally gouge your eye out. He's speaking in the context of lusting after a woman. Well, you can gouge your eye out and still be lusting after a woman in your mind. No, he's exaggerating here to make this point. He says, you need to take sin seriously and deal with it drastically because unchecked sin can send you to hell. Here's one more example, and we could come up with lots of them. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, he says, if anyone does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And so does Jesus mean for you to literally hate your family members and to hate yourself? Otherwise, you can't be his disciple? No. He's overstating the case to make the point that devotion to him is to exceed all other relationships if you're going to be his disciple. Jesus doesn't want you to hate anybody, including yourself. He wants you to love him more than anybody. That's the point. We use hyperbole all the time ourselves. <clears throat> when you talk about someone carrying around weighing a, something weighing a ton, <clears throat> now does it really weigh a ton? Well, if it did, you probably wouldn't be able to carry it. Or you say, I've been waiting forever. Really? Forever? Maybe a long time. I'm so hungry I can eat a horse. I'd like to see that. Maybe you're like Joey Chestnut who last week ate 62 hot dogs in 10 minutes. <clears throat> Let's see how many you can chug down. Or I walked a million miles to get there. That means you walked around the world 40,000 times. Maybe we should look at the tread on your shoes. These are all exaggerated expressions. This is what Jesus is doing when he says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for a prayer, believe that you have received it, 
and it will be yours. Again, notice the context. In verse 22, just right before this, he says, Have faith in God. That's what he's really talking about. Have unwavering faith in God as you pray. That's what he's saying. In verse 25, he says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. In other words, he's taking us back to James. He's not saying that we can treat God like some vending machine who must give us whatever we want. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And so if we pray for wisdom, and we're asking for God's will, then we can expect him to answer. It may not be the answer we're looking for, but the only way we're to pray is with faith in God. It doesn't mean that you won't have doubts, but that you're coming to God with your doubts. It doesn't mean that every prayer will turn out exactly how you pray. In an exaggerated way, Jesus is saying, seek God and trust God. Seek God's will and trust God with the answer. You're to pin your hopes on God, not on his answers. Somebody said, worry is believing God won't get it right. Well, trust is believing in God that eventually it will be all right. When you have doubts, seek God and trust God. Don't waver in your confidence in Him. When the ethicist John Cavanaugh went to work for three months in the house of the dying with Mother Teresa, he was seeking a clear answer for how to best spend the rest of his life. On the first morning when he met Mother Teresa, she asked him, What can I do for you? He asked her to pray for him. What do you want me to pray for? He voiced the request he had carried with him for thousands of miles as he traveled from the United States. Pray that I might have clarity. In other words, he was asking for certainty about what he was to do with the rest of his life. Mother Teresa says she couldn't do that. When he asked why, she said, Clarity is the last thing that you're clinging to, and you must let go of it. Kavanaugh said that she always seemed to have clarity for what she longed for. She just laughed at him and said, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I pray that you will trust God. And so everything James is really saying here, when we think he's talking about doubt, he's really talking about wisdom, it comes down to this. Trust God when you're not sure whether you can trust anything else. And he will never fail you. God, I want to thank you this morning that we can come to you with our doubts, our questions, about the uncertainties of life and know that you will give, give us wisdom. Wisdom to know how to think about them, wisdom to know how to live in the midst of them, wisdom for putting our trust completely in you, that regardless of how, how things seem to be at the moment, we can trust that you will lead us in the right way and lead us in the direction of what you have intended for our lives. And so, Lord, today, we come to you with maybe the doubts that we have here today. You know what they are, the questions upon our minds and hearts. Lord, give us wisdom for what it is that we must do. And give us faith to believe that you will do as you have said you will do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.